Good morning. Good morning, all of you. Thank you so much for the great introduction. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm honored and quite humbled by this space. Um, thank you to the Midtown Alliance for inviting me to share some of what we've been up to. Um, I'm thrilled because we've been working with the Midtown Alliance for about six months to try to understand public life, this thing that you've heard a lot about this morning, um, to understand public life in the district and come up together with a story about how it is a driver for the next chapter of Midtown. Some of you were here last year when my colleague Matthew waxed poetically, literally, po poet, poetry um, on this stage. I'll try to do him justice, but I'm also here, as John alluded to, to share some hard truths um, and a little bit of inspiration about what our team has learned. But first, I'm gonna give it all away. The big idea I wanna share with you here today is actually remarkably small. It's quite soft, sometimes it's funny. Um, I'm here to talk about people and public life. You, your neighbor sitting next to you, um, this is what we study at Yale. I'm here as a designer, probably the turtleneck gave it away, um, but I'm also here as a social scientist, an observer um, of you and your neighbors and your friends, understanding how public life comes together in cities. So I wanna help you see public life in Midtown the way that my team sees it. So take a moment and think of your favorite memory of a city. Maybe you were traveling, maybe it's in your neighborhood or here in Midtown. You are probably in a place that you think is beautiful, maybe interesting. Maybe you bonded with someone over a shared experience or you participated in a spectacle. Maybe you were up to some innocent mischief, or if you weren't, your teenage kid probably was. Maybe you were demonstrating something that you believed in with your body on the street, or maybe you were alone. No matter what, I can assure you that your favorite moment in a city could probably be described in the blink of an eye, a small moment catching someone's gaze or communing with yourself or the space in a small way. That's public life. It's both a barometer and a catalyst of a good city. It's this thing that we create together when we're invited to discover, participate, connect, shape, and share experiences. And when we lose sight of it, urban quality slips. So this is how we do our work. We focus on life. What is the life we want to create in a space? Then how do we design space around that quality of life? And finally, at the very end, then we design buildings to support those two things. And that's where value really comes from, alluding to John. It comes from those micro moments which create relationships, which create attachment to place, energy, a brand of a place, a vibe, and even, I can say here in the Fox, a legacy of Midtown, a place like Midtown. So we've been doing this for a long time. This is Jan, started our firm. Um, his students actually started the firm. He transformed the city of Copenhagen. We've gone on to transform many, many cities around the world. In fact, we've worked with over 300 cities around the world in this very simple premise of putting public life first. So when we came to Midtown, we were looking for something in particular. We were looking for a post-pandemic story. What's the post-pandemic story of Midtown? We've been doing a lot of research about how people are using cities after the pandemic. Um, this photo on the left looks sort of quaint now. Um, we spent a lot of time in the pandemic in circles, little circles, six feet away from, away from each other. There's some things about the pandemic that have changed culture and are really gonna be sticking with us. In some cities, like where I live in San Francisco, we've actually made some of the slow streets that were seemed temporary, an emergency measure, they're now permanent. Other streeteries or street closures around the country, they're also permanent. We're really interested to find with you um, what is Midtown's post-pandemic story. So I'm gonna give you a sliver of what we found in our public life action plan and I invite you to download it when it's sent to you um, over email after this event. Um, and here's a little bit of what we found. We 
spent about six months trying to understand how people use Midtown. We walked every street and mapped its facade quality and we measured public life. We spent a bunch of time with a really fantastic steering committee, so thank you all of you who served in the steering committee. A bit of what we found. What has been alluded to today and what you know, Midtown has an incredibly strong foundation for growth. This is one of the most high capacity um, organizations, the Midtown Alliance, that helps support this growth. This district is really the envy of many of the districts that I work with, and I'm really excited to actually bring some of the lessons that we've learned from you um, to all the cities that we work with around the country. So what's working? It's a lot of stuff that you know. Really, really strong arts and culture venues and strong institutions, great public art program, um, artist in residence program, more people living here, more people working here, and a mixed use that means not only good things for the economic profile, but a more interesting public life at eye level. There's more serendipity, there's more community building, there's more just interest when you have a mixed use community and Midtown has got it. People describe Midtown streets as walkable and definitely they are. It's an incredibly dense street grid with redundant streets, which is really good for people like me who are trying to do different things with a street grid because it means you can take a couple of them out of circulation. It doesn't break the system. Um, there's a lush tree canopy. It's really fantastic. And when you think about the sort of architectural vernacular, the urban quality, it's really unique. It reminds me of some of the best parts of Melbourne, Australia, where I've spent some time working with really nice class A office up in the sky and at eye level in its best moments, a really gritty, interesting, unique character um, that I really love. So there are some really strong pockets of public life, um, like the ones you see here. And it takes a lot of work. A lot of you have been working for decades to make this true, and it's showing. But when we look at the district as a whole, we have some things to share with you. Unfortunately, all of this growth that is all true and exciting and things that you should be proud of, everyone here has worked really hard to create, it's not translating to eye level. Why is that? There's these incredible pockets of quality, these hot spots, drivers of growth, people want to be there. But in between, it's sort of like a dead zone. So we came up with four key challenges that we built strategies around. The first one is in public, spa public space activation. There's lots of public spaces in Midtown. Actually, 94% of all the spaces that you have are privately owned, which is really interesting um, and provides a unique opportunity. But there's some challenges, like where are the people? The second one is around some issues at eye level. Um, there are some issues with just vacancy, 19% vacancy in the district. Um, that's really challenging. When we think about the design of those ground floors, and we're going to talk more about this in detail, many of them are reflective, repellent glass. People are using the same architecture that they're bringing to the top all the way, like an extrusion, all the way down to the ground floor. That's not what we want to see, and it really is repellent. How do we fix that? And then finally, when we think about moving around the district, many of your streets, which are really effective um, corridors for car transportation, are very car-oriented. They're not inviting people to move through the district in a new way to string, th uh, string different experiences together. And that's what I want to leave you with today. This core challenge, which was our challenge when we thought about these four, these four issues, how to give people a good reason to come to Crescent Street, enjoy themselves, but then take a walk come to the Fox Theater and have lunch afterwards. Um, how can we develop a strategy that builds from these pockets of quality and strings together a complete, vibrant ground floor experience? So we have some tools for that. The first is to embrace different character areas. So we've heard that Midtown has a very expansive identity. And when we ask people to describe it, we got a lot of different answers, and none of them um, were uh, necessarily describe the, dist the total district well. And we think one of those reasons is because Midtown is a large district and has many different smaller pockets of sort of character. So what's right for the heart of the arts is not necessarily what's right in what we're calling the neighborhood zone. We think that actually breaking down this identity is going to help all of you make smarter choices about how to invest, what to put at the ground floor, what types of activities and events to put in the public spaces. Use these character areas as a way to um, drive that type of investment. 
So those character areas are helping with our four strategies. Roughly the first two are about increasing desire. This is something that Matthew identified last year. So activating public spaces and making new ones and enlivening ground floors, that's about giving people more reasons to come to Midtown. The second two are, once they're there, don't stop their journey. Don't make that walk sort of bleak or boring or unsafe. Um, soften the edges to make the walking experience wonderful. Foster seamless mobility to get people to go from one place to another. Okay, strategy number one. Um, program and activate existing public spaces and create new ones. So there's lots of public space in Midtown. There's more to be created, but think about the space that you do have. It's very unique that a lot of it is privately owned, but sometimes, I don't know, y'all go a little overboard with some of the rules and regs. Um, this sign, which is maybe de uh, put up to um, limit some undesirable activity, also makes me not want to go there. So how can we um, make spaces more inviting? And in some of the spaces that are new, brand new, they just got a facelift, they're beautiful, but there's not a lot happening there. So it's a beautiful platform, but where's the star? Um, it needs some, some creature comforts, comforts to make people comfortable and invite people there. So we think the key strategy here is actually a regular cadence of activation. So not just a big event, pride, or some big event that brings people down, but something that invites people on the everyday, a coffee cart, and weekly, Thursday music or comedy, um, and something extraordinary that brings people there. You need to sort of craft this all together. So what could that look like? Well, it could look like a pop-up movie theater in that pesky vacant lot on 12th and Peachtree, you know the one. It could look like f being a little bit more flexible with open container laws on Crescent Street like they do in fr on Frenchman Street in New Orleans, one of the greatest cities in the world, um, to let people sort of spill out and enjoy themselves. It could look like using the front yard of the High Museum for something like an artist-designed putt-putt. There's lots of things to do, especially keeping Peachtree open um, for your awesome open streets events. So what could this look like? Well, here's an example of the Bank of America Plaza. It's brand new, it's got a nice facelift. What would it look like to just add that, a little bit of a star, a little bit of an invitation? Um, you can bring someone's coffee cart that comes in the morning and maybe in the evening they stay on for drinks um, and there's a comedy night in the afternoon. That's just something that can really bring people there. Maybe that's really successful in its first year and you decide to go to the next level. What would it look like to actually put a true anchor to activate public space? Something that provides a little more um, thermal, thermal, thermal comfort, so when it's raining or when it's cold or hot, you've got a little pavilion there. And what if that pavilion was designed by a SCAD grad? Well, that's what I'm talking about, about a strategy for public life in activating public spaces. I wanna raise the bar a little bit. I've been really inspired by what New York City has been doing with the, their Alfresco NYC. So they've invited um, businesses to hire different creative firms, artists, designers, and use their talents to invite people to come out into the street for streeteries and public events and, and so on. And it's become so successful. They're, they've done many iterations of this. There's now an award circuit for it. So the next step for activating public spaces might be to create coordinated groups around these character areas, define the types of activations you wanna see, and maybe make a little award circuit to celebrate all the great work that you're doing. And do it this summer. Um, it could be a great summer for this. So the second strategy, which is related, is enlivening ground floors. And I believe this is a photo from here in the district. You've got some wonderful, uh, alive ground floors, but Better street level retail is very critical to serving community needs. I've heard it's really even hard to like get a bottle of water walking up Peachtree Street. Um, it supports public life and it builds community. And I have to say this strategy, you know, there's a part of it that is, yes, altruistic, building the public life in the district, um, seeing beyond your own walls and understanding that investing in the ground floor supports the whole district. Um, but it also has a, has a benefit to individual property owners. Um, we all know that the right retail experience on the ground floor of office buildings can really attract great office tenants at much higher, at much higher office rates. So we know that's really hard. Um, a lot of 
people here in the audience, and I know this very well, I've been working with Google for the last couple of years, it's very tempting to put wonderful amenities, not at the ground floor, but on like the seventh, eighth floor amenity decks, gym, cafeteria, wonderful plaza. We know that tenants are asking for that, but they're also asking for a vibrant experience in Midtown. It's why they decided to locate here. So think about what you can externalize at the ground floor to help with this strategy. And this is why it's important. 19% of Midtown storefronts are vacant. They look like this, and they've been sitting like this for a while. Some of them are not vacant, but were designed to be activated in a different way. You know this, and we see this all over the country, the sort of fine-grained storefronts that look like they should be like little shops, but, and they have instead um, non-reflective like reflective glass and shades pulled down. Um, this is a great little set of um, storefronts, but actually, it's a dentist office. That's great, we all need dentists, but what could we put also um, in, this, in these spaces that could complement that? Like a healthy candy store? Talk to me after. Um, we also have to call out, every building has a back. We all have backs, we need them. Um, buildings need backs, cities need streets that have backs, but we don't necessarily need to be looking at the back of your car when we're trying to enjoy a cocktail on Crescent Street. Um, there's a number of places where we could think differently about the sort of backs of our city. And here's what it could look like. A garage that's also a retail incubator. A hotel lobby that's also a podcasting studio or radio station. A pet-friendly cafe that spills onto a plaza and invites people at all hours. Or how about taking some of these big, empty storefronts that have been really sitting there for quite a long time, you're waiting for a big fish, but Maybe in the interim, could you fill it with creative tenants, this wonderful artist in residence program that Midtown has, um, and some other creative uses just to contribute to the street in the interim? So we know this looks really familiar to you. I'll give you an example. Matthew brought this up last year when he was here. It's just a couple blocks um, away. And it's H&R Block. Maybe I'll go there later to do my taxes. But you know, I don't think that H&R Block needs this expanse of the street. There's non-operable windows, it's really long, non-operable doors, really long and sort of boring looking. What could it look like to actually make this more than just a place for a puddle, really nice wide sidewalks, and use that wide sidewalk for something great? Break up that storefront into three different businesses, um, celebrate local businesses, add some of those creature comforts, lush planters, um, and really invite people to experience the street in a different way. It doesn't take much. The next strategy here for, um, for activating public spaces is to really perform a detailed market, market analysis and a merchandising plan based on these different character areas, really trying to dive deeply into what each of these character areas needs to be successful. So the third strategy, the first two were about increasing desire. And the second two are about removing barriers, and this is my favorite one. It's about soft edges, and I like it because I like to talk about people as being soft, and the cities that we love are also soft to us. So what does this mean? Today, there's lots of wonderful new buildings in Midtown. You're growing, that's amazing. Sometimes, the newness, that shiny, brand new feeling, it looks a little too shiny and a little too brand new, like it's sort of repellent at the ground floor. And that matters to us because as human beings, we need 1,000 stimuli per hour to feel interested, actually to feel safe. So many of you, I know the lights are down, but would look around at the Fox Theater and think, wow, how beautiful and interesting, so many details. Um, this, is, this is the type of space that makes us feel comfortable and, and interested. What we're looking at here is like repellent. It bounces your eyeballs. Um, it's not interesting. It makes you wanna turn the other way and find something more that's nicer to look at. Um, sometimes it's confusing about how you get in. There's glare on, on that ground floor, even during the day. It's long and flat and just sort of blah. Sometimes it's like really out of scale, like the designer really tried to sort of pull back the building a little bit, but it's totally out of scale from the human scale. And this is something that um, the architecture community is starting to think about. I invite you to read this article. It is scathing. Um, I had to cut some slides for time, but believe me, I was about to put in some slides from Midtown. You're welcome. Did not put them in there. Um, 
the article is about how bland things have become. It's mostly about the um, design review phase and the architecture process, but I would love to write a response to this that's just about the ground floor. What the sort of blandness, placelessness of some design in our buildings in American cities, what that's doing, uh, what that's doing to our cities, and it's not great. So I think our steering committee said it best. Thank you, steering committee member. Come up and shake my hand later. I want an autograph. They said, don't make the bottom look like the top. So you can have a wonderful glassy building, and indeed, I think one of the core wonderful qualities of Midtown is this sort of tension between big, beautiful offices and the sort of grittiness um, at the eye level. That's great, but don't bring that architecture down to the bottom. Don't do it. Um, so I said that we walked every single street of Midtown. That's not totally true. Um, the Midtown Alliance and their amazing team of volunteers walked every single block of Midtown. And here's what we found in terms of how Midtown stacks up to some of the stuff I've been talking about. There are some great facades, absolutely. Here's two of them. But they're scattered across Midtown and they're outnumbered, sadly, by low quality facades. So when we look at these pockets of quality, it's just eight strong block edges or 5% on the major corridors that have these A and B facades. It's not enough. Midtown deserves better. And you're very, very close to getting there. So I also said that we studied public life um, in addition to public space. And when we put those two data sets together, we found that actually some of the highest concentrations of public life are also where the greatest quality of public space is. So we know that improving the quality of public space is going to improve the vibrancy of public life. Let's do it. How can we do it by softening edges? These are just inspiration photos, so don't take me literally, but um, it could be really fun to think about some ways to soften edges, putting out some nice goods display, hiring a florist and having them do up your, your retail tenant's facade, um, hiring a SCAD grad and doing some wacky, amazing pavilion. Could be light and it could be cheap. If that works, you could go a little bit deeper. You could open up a lobby and actually create this wonderful sort of inside-outside space. You could have an occupiable edge of a building and really create a sort of radically lush experience um, at that edge. That feels soft to me. So I wanna thank the Midtown Alliance for making these awesome renderings. This one is really, really exciting. Um, so this is the former AT&T Innovation Center. Um, it's a, on a pretty fast moving street. Um, we'll get to that in the mobility section, but these one-way pairs um, really invite fast car movement and it can be really challenging for public life at eye level. Um, but we know that some of the parklets have been really successful on Spring Street, and we want to do something like that here, potentially. And look at this long facade. Like, I know you guys aren't experts, but you could probably call out. Like, it's not great. It's not doing much. It's got this frosted glass. Like, it just feels like it could just go on forever and ever and ever. You'll never reach your destination. What could it look like to really think differently? Make this a soft edge both in the sort of tactileness, adding planters and seating, a nice place to sit, but also really adding porosity, um, adding more entrances, creating this wonderful open, um, this open space at the ground floor. This could be really exciting. It would really change the edge. It would invite more public life. And this is sort of the ultimate um, expression of a soft edge that we want to think about. So the final strategy is about fostering seamless mobility in the district. And this is really important. Um, it's something actually that I work on a lot in my work at Gale is thinking about how we can design wonderful places of movement that are comfortable, seamless, and as delightful as riding in a car. It's possible, people, to make a transit system that is better than riding in your car, I promise. Um, we're really happy to be working with the Midtown team. I mentioned earlier that Y'all are very high capacity. It is especially true in the transportation department. Um, and what they will tell you and what we also found is that not everywhere, because Midtown, as I mentioned, has an incredible street grid, really dense um, density of intersections, like all the numbers that us urban planners love crunching. Um, you've got it and you've worked decades to create it. Don't give it away. 
Um, but you have created some pretty fast moving streets. Um, some of your one way pairs with numerous lanes of traffic, cars move too fast. Um, I think over 60% of streets in Midtown are uh, over 30 miles per hour speed limit. And you see situations like this, which is just like not inviting <laughs> to, walk, to walk in the district. Um, streets in Midtown make up 20% of your public space. So we have a whole strategy about public space. A lot of you are probably involved in privately owned public spaces, all the pops that I mentioned in our first strategy. But those of you who are from MARTA or the planning department or are thinking about streets, you have as much responsibility to contribute to the vibrancy of Midtown as the people who are controlling those public spaces. And that's because streets make up 20% of the territory of Midtown. It could be a lot more inviting. Um, there's numerous places with also like grade change where pedestrians really have to fight it out with cars, with all of these curb cuts and parking garage entryways. There needs to be a strategy for this. I mentioned that I think that transit can be just as inviting, efficient, and desirable as driving in a car. I believe that. Um, I love a picture like this. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. It looks just like BART. And we should really work on like a cross-city strategy because whatever we're coming up with for BART in the Bay Area, y'all need to also work on um, with MARTA here because these plazas are quite big and they really could be inviting, exciting, like a really wonderful walkable destination, maybe even get some of your errands done um, if they become more mixed use. So those are some of the challenges. We think what it could look like, um, a different type of mobility, sort of people first mobility in, in Midtown could look like putting cars in their place putting them in structured parking and sort of hiding them at the ground floor, um, allowing for pickup and drop off in a car, sure, but with space that has been given over to parking and lots of through lanes, actually think of ways that you can put your values into the street grid, the values of walking, the values of promenading in Midtown, um, create opportunities and invitations for people to try taking a bike, try scooting, extending your bike lanes through the district. What could that look like? Well, you all have really, really great transportation plans already. My recommendation to you is to do it. <laughs> Just do it. It's great. <laughs> um, it's not rocket science, um, and it can be, but it looks really exciting when it's there. I, I guess there's lots of like great renderings of the future of, of transportation and good design. NACDO does good work, for example. But I don't know if you feel this way. When you actually see it in public space, it's like a revelation. And the reason it feels that way is because as a human being walking, and even if you drive, you start your trip by walking and you end your trip by walking, most of us, um, you feel really honored as a human being. You feel really comfortable and safe and seen because people are sort of at your, or the street design is at your scale. That's how I feel when I look at this photo on the upper left. Like, oh, someone thought of me. That's my size. Um, so do it. Um, think creatively about MARTA, as, MARTA location, uh, stops as a mixed use opportunity, not just to create housing and density, but also to provide um, amenities at the ground floor that people desperately need and to incentivize people to like go to the Whole Foods that's in the MARTA station before they go home instead of taking that car trip, for example. And then of course you can have a lot of fun with bike lanes, walking paths, there's a level of delight that's available to us um, who are doing interesting transportation design that is not the same when you're doing like highway design, for example. So lots of great inspiration here. Talk to the local planners um, at the Midtown Alliance and elsewhere and do it. What could that look like here? Well, I invite you when you spill out from this wonderful event, caffeinated and inspired. Um, don't walk into the street because the sidewalk is really, really narrow. <laughs> but think to yourself, what could Peachtree Street look like if it had a different um, balance of who it prioritized? So this is something that the Midtown Alliance is studying and it's really, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens here. What if you took one lane, just one, and created a little more of a generous buffer for walking. And it's not just important here around the Fox, this legendary institution creating public life that spills out and showing people how exciting it is to be inside, but out on the street. Um, 
Think about like expanding the, pub, uh, the sort of performance elements of the Fox into the public realm, having public art here, having this sort of be, this part of Peachtree be an extension of your experience in the Fox. And what would that do to supporting different businesses? I know someone wants to make a beer garden around here. If the street was a little more inviting for people to walk, um, you might see a really different land use and different uses that relates to the other strategies that we've just been talking about. So this one is really exciting to look at. So that's what I wanna share with you. There's so much good work to do. Um, I got some good like nonverbal communication during this presentation, I got some laughs. So I feel like we might be on the same page, but you may, you may have questions. You may be concerned, is this expensive? Is this my responsibility? The Midtown Alliance is doing great. They can just handle it. Do people actually want this? Like those are photos of other cities. Will this cause a safety issue? And is this really essential? There's so many competing priorities. And to this, I wanna tell you, I know there's a lot of words in the slide, bear with me. People want these investments and when they get them, they love them. So. Almost 100% of the people who we talk to and in, this, in your community survey, they say they want a better experience for walking. They say they want more publicly accessible open space and they want that open space to be more interesting. They wanna sit, they wanna visit, they want food, they want stuff happening. They just don't want the territory. They want something interesting to be happening there. And when you give it to them, so in the streets alive, so many people come out for that. Um, when you did commercial real commons, Colony Square, like these are amazing hotspots in Midtown. When you create it, people come. So do it all together. And that's the final thing I wanna share with you is that like everybody else on this stage has mentioned, this is not a um, solo sport, this is a team sport. This is something that you all need to work on together. The people doing transportation with the leasing people and the developers in this room and city planners and everybody at the Alliance you all need to really work together to invest in public life and really realize this uh, shared value for Midtown. So thank you so much. I'm gonna be down here at the stage um, chatting afterwards, but I'm, I'm really excited to see what you do soon, like this summer um, in defining Midtown's post-pandemic story. Thank you.